Greetings, students, and welcome to this episode of The Professor Travel. I am your host, The Professor Travel, coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the website, the vlog, and the podcast that you come to in order to understand and learn more about different travel destinations and different things involving travel. This is where we go to discuss them as a community. This is hopefully inspiring you to travel more and ultimately to enjoy life more. Now, you can reach me on a variety of different platforms, including, of course, through my website, YouTube channel, and Facebook, all at The Professor Travel. I'm now available on TikTok. If you want to reach me there, you can find me at The Professor Travel. Um, if you're an Instagrammer, you can find me on there at The underscore Professor underscore Travel. I'm also available on Twitter at The Professor TR1. And then finally, if you're a blogger, you can find me on Blogspot at TheProfessorTravel.blogspot.com. Today, we're welcoming back a visiting professor who's been with us a couple of times, Chad Swinney or should I say Dr. Chad Swinney. Say hi to everybody, Chad. <laughs> hey, everybody. Great to be on the show. Uh, thanks for coming back again. I really appreciate it. We're going to do a little, something a little bit different with this specific vlog and podcast. Instead of talking about a destination, we're actually going to talk a little bit about airplanes. We're going to talk about airlines. We're going to talk about travel programs. So that way, hopefully, the students will get a little bit more um, direct information on why to involve themselves and, and why they should be asking questions about these things before they travel. Uh, but before we get into all of those things, I want to ask you really quickly about the picture that we have here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where this was? Yeah, uh, this is a photo of me. I'm there on the right, a little, little chunkier than I am right now. Me and my husband at probably one of my favorite places in the world, which is the Prague Christmas Market in Prague, Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, by far the, so um, in Europe during the winter, right before the Christmas holiday, very common that, you know, public squares, public streets will have these little booths like you see uh, selling everything from blue wine, which is like fortified warm wine, to souvenirs, uh, to pastries. Uh, the one in uh, Prague is the best known one. So you go there and you'll see people from it's basically where everyone from the rest of Europe comes to. It's uh, absolutely gorgeous. So probably my favorite place to go for Christmas um, in the whole world. That's awesome. We've been talking yeah. about going to a Christmas market for a while. So we were trying to figure out, there's a few, I think, on the Rhone and on the, I think on the Rhine as well uh, that yep. do, um, I think Nuremberg is the one I keep hearing about as well. And that's supposed to be fairly yep. decent. So, yeah, there are a few in Germany that are pretty good too, but Prague, I think, takes the cake. Nice. Okay. Well, for the benefit of my students, for those who have not heard your previous vlog and podcast, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about your credentials, maybe a little bit about your educational background and apart from Prague, some of the other places that you've been to? Yeah, for sure. So um, by education and training, I'm an adult learning professional. So I have a doctorate in adult learning and uh, as a profession, I uh, manage instructional design and training teams for tech companies. So that's kind of what I do for my day job. And in terms of travel, uh, I average around 250 to 300,000 uh, flight miles a year, almost exclusively for fun. Uh, most of my work travel tends to be kind of domestic uh, West Coast shuttle kind of stuff. So all my travel is mostly just for my own personal enjoyment. Um, I think I, I forget my number, but I, I've been, because I have been keeping track of it, but I've been to uh, at least like 15, maybe 20 countries. Mm -hmm. um, a, a few of my, the highlights, favorite places I've been, um, the Maldives, mm -hmm. which is uh, an island chain in the Indian Ocean, uh, one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. Um, as you've seen here, Prague, I think as cities go, is absolutely the most amazing city, and the most beautiful city in the world. Um, and then right at, the, at that same level, I think, is Singapore is just an amazing, clean, beautiful, high-tech, fun city. So those are some of the places I've been that I'm, I'm, I really love. And I also love uh, just visiting Canada and Mexico. Absolutely. So let's start to talk a little bit about airlines. And let's start to talk about um, how those things started to happen, what started to promote airplanes, things like that. I can tell you just from my study of the, of the subject matter um, that most people during the early 1900s were traveling um, by a ships across the Atlantic. And then of course, when Lindbergh came across into his famous flight, then you started to see uh, that almost be okay for 
people to start to fly domestically. So they started with airlines like Pan Am and some ocean uh, travels. And then recently in, in modern history, we've had a lot of mergers of different airlines. Did you want to speak a little bit to about your understanding about some of those yeah. things? So yeah, um, and even even going back to, so to that older history and really the beginning of what we think of as the big airlines today, um, like Delta, United, American, these are all combinations of smaller airlines that started right after the beginning of flight. And they were primarily, uh, you, like the primary source of revenue was carrying mail. And they carried passengers sort of incidentally, and that wasn't their primary revenue driver. They were mainly subsidized by mail carriage. Um, but then uh, over time, the system in the US uh, called regulation, it's basically regulated air travel, uh, created a system where they essentially treated the airlines like a public utility. So fares were preset. Um, you know, each airline had specific cities that they would fly between, and the fare was already decided. So there was no real competition in the airline industry. So uh, that was, that's what a lot of people think of as sort of the golden age or heyday of travel. This was when, um, you know, because there was no price competition, uh, airlines only competed on quality of service. So this is where people, you would see people wearing their, you know, their Sunday hats and their white gloves to fly. But it was also extremely, extremely expensive and out of the reach uh, of virtually all Americans. It was only a small percentage of people who were able to, to try to fly as a, as a mode of travel. And then uh, the real, when I went, when I think about recent history, the real there were there were two there were two things that changed. The first was the the jet age starting in the 50s when um, you know the when the jet airliners starting with the the, um, the comet were actually kind of real things that pe that people could could fly on. So that started an age of uh, transcontinental travel and then intercontinental travel. Um, the other, I think, actually more interesting thing that happened recently was deregulation. So in 1978, the United States passed the Airline Deregulation Act. And this is actually what invented a lot of the airlines that we know today. Um, essentially, they removed the kind of public utility concept of airlines and allowed any airline to compete on, tri on price, so this is where, uh, for example, Southwest Airlines was invented. Um, America West Airlines, which, late, which now is American. Um, and uh, a lot of the, what you think of as low cost carriers were invented during this era because there was uh, no regulation. And this was really, you know, people complain a lot about uh, air travel and fees and being treated like cattle and all of those things. but deregulation uh, for all of the things that it did wrong it literally made air travel accessible to everyone it's the yeah. reason that you can go visit your grandmother and that just wasn't something that was even part of normal living before <laughs> 1978 yeah in fact i think to my my parents coming across country they used to live in massachusetts and then they migrated to southern california no, I, I asked them, well, why didn't, you tr why didn't you fly back in the day? And they were like, well, it was just way too expensive for anybody to be able to even try and do that. So, I mean, that brings us to, you know, carriers that were around at the time, like Pan Am, uh, which started off um, as kind of this, you know, like these larger carriers. And I, I remember um, when I was living on the East Coast, Continental Airlines was another one. Um, and they were around for a while. They got wrapped, they got uh, like enveloped into United. And so a lot of these different airlines haven't necessarily um, just gone bankrupt and died off. I mean, there's a, there's a handful that have been, but for the most part, yeah. they've been developed by a lot of the larger carriers nowadays. And you have some that are domestic and you have some that are international. For example, uh, Southwest, Southwest, Airli Southwest Airlines and Alaska tend to focus primarily on domestic, even though Alaska does have a lot of international stuff that they can do but it's limited in certain reach. Just like with Southwest, they go to Puerto Rico and I think they go down to the Caribbean as well, um, but not what I would call extended 
international in order for you to see those flights you either go have to go with i would i would probably say uh, a carrier that's subsidized by a country um a private carrier or one of the larger carriers would you agree with that um yeah um well it, it's interesting you bring up subsidies because i think that's probably the most um controversial topic in airline in the airline industry right now so essentially uh when you think about the the large international airlines there's what people call the us3 which is delta america and united and then there's the me3 the middle eastern three which is uh qatar etihad in Emirates. And those are really the six players that are fighting for the global, kind of the global international market. And um, controversially, the Middle East, the, the ME3 are, depending on who you ask, in one way or another, highly subsidized by their governments, mm -hmm. um, which allows them to provide better service. Uh, and they also have you know, but I, I personally would consider some questionable labor practices that allow them to have lower operating costs um, in addition to being subsidized by their government in one way or another. Now, you can also argue that U.S. carriers are subsidized by the government because, you know, uh, of bailouts and the support that the FAA provides. Um, but in my opinion, it doesn't even come close to the level of subsidy that the Middle Eastern carriers receive. But yeah, and that's kind of the, this overall landscape there. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, two of the ones that come to mind, um, that and they're not any ones that we've mentioned thus far, are like uh, Air New Zealand, and mm -hmm. they're primarily they're not subsidized by the federal government, but more by a conglomerate of the wine industry, in addition to the private um, uh, investors that they have. <clears throat> so that's why when you go onto one of their flights, it's like the wine is free flowing, and that's never an issue. Or you have um, Carriers like uh, Iceland Air or or formerly Wow Air, uh, which were in part subsidized by the Icelandic government in an effort to try and get people to come visit Iceland before jumping over to Europe. So, whether or not something is beneficial based on the subsidies, I think that they are promoting, uh, maybe has to do with intent and uh, yeah. where that's going with that. So, I mean, there's a lot of different thoughts on, I guess, that whole process. I think you're absolutely right when you talk about the questionable practices that go along with some of the uh, people in the industry. But then again, you know, um, those are based on our standards. Uh, when we look at a global, when we look at this from a global lens, it's kind of interesting because there's so many different people who have different views on, you know, things like unions and things like uh, uh, variable practices and human rights issues. So there's there's always going to be that, and it's it's very fascinating to see how the whole process works. Would you agree or on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So let's also talk about aircraft specifically, and I'd like to talk to you about weather. Um, obviously, different aircraft fly at different altitudes for a variety of different reasons. Domestically, I tend to see that a lot of aircraft tend to fly in like maybe the 10,000 range to maybe 20,000 range. But then when you get into international, they not only fly at higher speeds, but they fly much higher as well. Um, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, well, uh, yes, I certainly um, can talk about sort of, uh, I'll, well, uh, one of the places where I think this is the most interesting is how um, crossing the Atlantic Ocean works. Because uh, cross the, the, um, the flight tracks that go from North America to Europe are the, the busiest uh, international flight paths in, uh, in the world. And also, interestingly enough, there's not radar coverage. So if you think about the distance that an uh, average radar station can cover, um, it has to be land-based. And there are many points in between, um, well, the, so the two, the two um, like, the place basically where you leave North America is Gander, Newfoundland, and then the place where you arrive in air traffic control in Europe is called uh, Shanwick. Those are the two air traffic control stations that control uh, transcontinental traffic. And the reason it's interesting you brought up altitude is um, what, the, what they do is actually every day based on wind conditions, weather predictions, um, they actually create a specific set of tracks 
that have uh, th that the aircraft need to follow to go uh, in either direction. Mm. So it's a set of altitudes and a set of waypoints that they have to follow. Again, because once they get out into the ocean, they're flying blind. They, they can't necessarily see where everyone is at. And so in order to avoid collisions, you are, you're required to get clearance to go across one of those tracks. And then you have to follow that at a specific speed for the entire and altitude for the entire trip across. It's very fascinating. And, um, but one of the interesting uh, things that happens there is because of the way the wind pattern flows, you can actually vastly ex exceed the, um, the airspeed of your aircraft when you're flying across the Atlantic. So if you imagine you have, like just as a generic number, if you have an aircraft that's capable of flying 600 miles per hour, but you're on a lucky day where maybe the wind on that track is going 200 miles an hour in the same direction, you're flying at the ground speed equivalent of 800 miles an hour. And this is how you see some of these interesting record-breaking flights across the Atlantic when, uh, it, when a plane is flying faster than it can fly. Yeah. Quite literally. Um, when, when you get back to the, the kind of literal weather kind of storms, that's one of the things that's interesting is as advanced as, um, as our understanding of weather is, it's still a, a huge barrier to safety for aircraft. I mean, aircraft are very susceptible to wind, to thunderstorms. And uh, one of the interesting things that is, literally uncontrollable is what we think of as, as air turbulence. Mm, because it's I just asked you about that. It's completely invisible. So if you so you can use weather radar to see where there's are there are clouds because there's moisture and you can detect moisture. You can see where it's raining, where it's snowing because radar and other sensing techniques look for water. Turbulence, you know, the bumps that we think of the kind of everyday bumps there's no moisture difference between a, a wave of turbulence and, a, and the smooth air next to it. So there's literally no way to detect it, which is why if you now think about listening to the flight crew, they'll say things like, we're getting turbulence reported ahead and, or some other aircraft are warning us mm. that literally the only way that they know or could even guess that there's turbulence ahead is because an aircraft ahead of them has reported it. Yeah, so that's that's kind of that's why, you know, a, a bumpy flight isn't really anyone's fault because it's it's literally impossible to predict. So there's one other weather thing I'd like to talk to you about really quick, yeah. and, that's, and that's icing on wings when you're ready for takeoff. I yeah. know that I, that's sometimes that will delay a flight sometimes because of weather they'll even cancel flights. But with the icing on the wings, I can only imagine that it has to do with the weight of the ice that's on the aircraft or is it just is it the uh, constriction of the cold weather on the aircraft uh, why do you suppose that, i mean obviously there's a lot of us yeah. pay to it you know it actually is because the, it changes the characteristics of the flight surfaces hmm. so if you think about it you have your wings which have um you know which move up down um to adjust the amount of lift and then you have your uh, rear control surfaces, which are actually what provide the aircraft up and down direction. Um, and then there's also ice on uh, you know that can be uh, that can be on the fuselage, mm. and it essentially changes the aerodynamic characteristics of the plane itself, and can render it uh, difficult or impossible to control. That's the main danger from ice on aircraft, and that can happen both on the ground um, and in the air under certain conditions, ice will collect on the wing. So, um, air, so aircraft actually have um, different types of systems, normally some kind of a heating system that prevents ice from building up on the wings while they're in flight or on, should say on the control surfaces while they're in flight. But that's, that's the main danger there is it, you know, I mean, if you, if you think about the average profile of a control surface, it's flat on the bottom and round on the top. Um, but as ice collects in different places, it changes the characteristics and changes how the aircraft is controlled. That makes sense. So um, let's also talk really quick about travel culture. I like to talk about this because when you go all over the world, there's a variety of different things. In fact, I just had a friend who 
um, traveled to Saudi Arabia, I think it was in August of last year, uh, for um, a religious ceremony, for a religious pilgrimage from Mecca to Medina. It wasn't the, it wasn't the holy month of Hajj, but there's another pilgrimage that you can do yeah. during the course of the year. And so what he ended up doing is, you know, you couldn't even leave the aircraft <laughs> unless you were wearing specific garments. And then if you did, you have to go directly to the mosque in order to be able to do that. So, I mean, different, different cultures on the aircraft can lead to a variety of different challenges, um, mm -hmm. both between passengers and flight crew. Um, but there are also certain expectations that are involved in that. Can you speak to maybe some of the experiences that you may have seen on aircraft in, re in reference to... Uh, whether it's people practicing their religion, whether it's um, yeah. certain certain uh, garments that people are required to wear, uh, talk yeah. to me about that. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, I think the main uh, place to see this again is in uh, Middle Eastern car carriers that have some very specific uh, religious requirements. There are some. So I, now I certainly have not flown on any, but there are several carriers that actually don't serve alcohol at all. But uh, Kuwait and Saudi um, don't serve any alcohol at all for religious reasons. It's, also, it's actually, though, quite interesting that some of the airlines with the best alcohol selections, the ME3, so your Etihad's, um, your Qatar and Emirates, um, while also um, you know, uh, associated with uh, very religious governments, they certainly don't have any problem with serving alcohol on, on the aircraft. Um, Although uh, what's, what's interesting on the ground, it can be a different situation. Uh, for example, the United Arab Emirates, you, uh, which is where Dubai is, you can, uh, you can only purchase alcohol if you're a non-Muslim. Mm -hmm. So Muslims are not, so there are, you can purchase liquor, but only if you're not a Muslim, which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then there are certain, um, it, it, when you think about uh, crew dress, um, I think uh, the, what, the dress, for example, on the Middle Eastern carriers is decidedly more conservative in terms of headwear and um, making, you know, having more of the skin covered uh, than you might, you might see in other carriers. I see you have a photo there of, uh, I don't love the term, but uh, for Singapore girls, which is the affectionate term by which Singapore Airlines flight attendants are referred to and um, that that is a, an iconic uh, flight crew uniform especially the blue um, so th those are also really interesting culturally yeah and then um, part of culture of course is art and that uh, usually will show either um, from the way that a plane might be designed and the artistic expression that the architects use or alternatively um, the flight crew area, the um, lounges, and a variety of different areas. Um, on board, it's usually pretty stark. They usually don't have a lot of room for artistic expression, unless you're familiar with some that have that. Uh, are you are you familiar with anything? Yeah, I, mean, okay. I think there are a few airlines that have a very distinctive visual, kind of visual language. Um, one that comes to mind is Austrian. They have a very kind of like cabin mountain look, lots of like flannels and cloths that are very evocative of the mountains, which are, which is really cool. Um, your uh, Emirates especially has a, um, has a look that is, I would personally describe as gaudy, lots of glossy wood and gold it very uh, kind of looks like if Donald Trump designed a plane. Lots of gold and shiny wood, um, which is interesting though, their newest aircraft, so uh, their newest 777s have moved away from that look and have a much more contemporary and, and modern feel. Um, yeah, uh, so those are, those, are, those are a few that stand out in terms of um, design. The other, I think probably one of the most famous um, when I think of art, um, the um, the air, airport in Qatar is famous for having a giant, like 50 foot tall teddy bear in the middle of the uh, terminal as an art installation, which is uh, definitely something everyone gets their photo taken with.
So. Oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> you have to. <laughs> um, speaking of variances, variances in culture, language. Yep. So, you know, we here in the United States, um, we tend to focus on maybe speaking English and then maybe having one additional language. But when you go to other countries, like Germany was one that really stood out to me. The people at the airport tend to speak three languages, you know? So, I mean, it's, it, it, it astounds me how easy it is for people in other countries to pick up languages. And um, that leads to some interesting dynamics when maybe one of those languages is not English and traveling to those destinations where maybe there is a little bit of a language barrier. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, well, so first, like specifically thinking of air travel. So uh, basically every air carrier, uh, air, air carrier you fly, it's expected that the flight crew will be fluent in English. Okay. For a couple reasons. One is um, it just uh, from a global universal language perspective, most airline passengers will at least be able to speak and understand some English. The only exception there is the Chinese carriers. Mm -hmm. So you think about your Hainans, Hainans especially in some of the Chinese carriers, the crews tend to not have uh, as strong of English skills as most other carriers, which is something to keep in mind if you're, uh, if you might not be comfortable with kind of dealing with the language barrier. Um, I, I remember, by the way, going on, I think it was South China Air when I went to yeah, Beijing, yeah. from LAX to Beijing, uh, or not yeah. Beijing, but Shanghai. And I remember that when we got over there and we had to get from there to Thailand, the, like the, almost the entire thing was in, um, I want to say it was in Mandarin. Um, and while I wasn't necessarily able to understand the language, I, they had visual cues in like the emergency uh, information and yeah. the videos they show you and things like that, that were pretty universal as far as that stuff goes. Yep. Yep. So, um, yeah. And then, yeah. And then in terms of language, you know, if you're, it really depends on where you're going. If you're going um, any place that, that caters to tourists, you're going to be able to generally find people who at least speak and understand English. Every airport will have signage and every airport in the world has signage in English. That's not anything you would ever need to worry about. Um, I think it's more if you start to get a little bit off the beaten path. Actually, funny enough, I, I was the one place in the world where I had the most trouble communicating was in Tijuana because I was actually uh, like, I, uh, I was there assuming because it's kind of an American border town that most people would speak, uh, would at least have some kind of workable English. And I had a hell of a time figuring out how to get, uh, get my eyebrows waxed and <laughs> finally had to find like another customer who spoke English who could explain what I wanted. No oh, wow. um, <laughs> yeah. The challenges of dealing with those things across the world. You never, you never know what to expect. And sometimes that can be a really interesting thing and eye-opening in some other cases. So um, in the same aspect, uh, diet and food on different types of travel excursions on airlines. Um, some airlines will work with you on halal um, type of, of, of food or, or um, kosher foods. Uh, you know, uh, others, others are a little bit more difficult uh you know, obviously some people are vegetarians uh that's pretty universal i think at this point or vegan in some cases um any unusual things that you've seen in terms of food or um no i mean any religious restrictions are pretty straightforward and are just part of the reservation process yeah um i will say my, my i think my, my one most interesting one was um if we were on a domestic flight on united on one of the last 747s before they retired them they did some domestic flights and I ordered a vegetarian meal and my vegetarian meal was two bowls of cereal and two yogurt cups in business class which I thought was really funny oh. um, <laughs> but uh, the other thing oh one of the other things actually that speaking of alcohol again is that also varies within countries one thing that is interesting in um, in India, certain states are dry and certain states are not. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're flying from, for example, um, uh, Ahmedabad, let's say to Delhi, 
Mm -hmm. um, you will not be served alcohol on the ground in Ahmedabad. You will not, you will only be served alcohol once you're in the air because mm -hmm. um, it's that's a, a dry area of India, interestingly enough. That's interesting. Uh, sports and recreation. Okay, so if I am traveling from the United States to China, Australia, Thailand, there are so many hours in that flight, you've got to have some level of entertainment. And in terms of how that's changed over the years, I remember seeing like, <laughs> and this is, gonna be, this is gonna date me a little bit, but uh, the movie Airplane, okay? Back in the 1970s, early 80s, um, when you see, you know, yeah, they had magazines, yeah, they had crossword puzzles, but that was pretty much it. Nowadays, people have entertainment, things they have usb ports there's a lot of changes that have happened in terms of recreation and things that you can do on the plane in order to keep yourself occupied for quite some number of hours um what is your perspective in terms of any type of things that you've seen that are either emerging or um you know it, uh, obviously wi-fi is a relatively newer concept within the last few years um in terms of being able to offer that abroad uh but what are your other thoughts on that yeah, um, well, most of your modern um, international aircraft are going to have uh, lots of preloaded movies, touchscreen entertainment systems. Um, so that's, that's pretty common on any international carrier now. Um, what's interesting, uh, one interesting trend in domestic travel in the U.S. is the move to slimline seats and bring your own device. Um, so in an effort, um, you know, this is basically everybody but Delta is doing this now, is um, you know, in an effort to save costs save, and save fuel costs, actually, by lowering the weight of the aircraft, they are not installing entertainment uh, screens into, the, into seat backs anymore. And the, with the expectation that most people are already bringing their own device, so they have a setup in which you would, uh, use, you would connect to Wi-Fi on the plane to watch whatever entertainment you want, which is, I think, it's interesting. Uh, I think a lot of people don't like it because they like having the kind of touch screen entertainment available. I, I will say this, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the difference on this one. I, I actually do like it uh, because, you know, yeah. if I've already downloaded the app from the organization, like United has their own app for it, and the, yep. the thing has Wi-Fi on it, I can watch a huge collection of movies that I did that I actually don't already own and they're pretty easy to gain access to. So for me, it's actually not a big deal, but again, everybody's going to have a different opinion on it, especially like if, maybe you don't want to watch it on that little type of cell phone. Maybe you want to watch it on the tablet or something larger, in which case that's not necessarily readily available to you. So um, what about holidays? Are you familiar? Are there any airlines that are out there that you're aware of that actually close for holidays or are off? Um, cause I think, I think for the most part, the universal idea is that most airlines are open even on the holiday timeframes. Yeah. But yeah. It, 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 and, um, well, a, a few, a few interesting examples when it comes to that. Um, one is El Al, which is the national airline of Israel, whose government subsidies are based on it, on them never flying during Sabbath. So, for example, if you are um, like taking a Thursday afternoon flight and it unfortunately gets delayed to the point where you, the, um, the flight plan would involve you being in the air during Sabbath, that flight would potentially be canceled, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. Um, the other, one other interesting uh, phenomenon is uh, Ramadan charters, so, uh, or I'm sorry, Hajj charters. So during the Hajj, the number of charter flights like increases a crazy amount with um, people basically just, because it's basically package travel, booking travels where people uh, charter an aircraft to, you know, go uh, to, go to uh, Mecca for Hajj and that's kind of, it's like a whole, it's like it's whole micro industry. Yeah. And, and in fact, I seen something similar to that when I was trying to price for uh, going to India during either Holi or Diwali. 
yeah that was, that was something that was that you're starting to see those prices jump up and there, there's a lot of challenges in that piece yeah. Um, let's move on to the travel population. So obviously on the screen here, I've, I've put a couple of, of, of at risk individuals that I tend to think, uh, when you travel, there are some challenges that are involved with these individuals, uh, whether it's yeah. the aging population, whether it's single parents traveling with multiple children, or whether it's someone who unfortunately might be, um, physically ob obese as, as defined by the CDC. Um, how have things changed in terms of those things over the last few years? And what are the, what are the risk factors that you're starting to see as being more prevalent? Um, yeah. So I think, um, I think, well, with the first one, accommodating guests of size, that's become a very hot issue with lots of very aggressive Facebook groups advocating for people of size. Um, but people still run into issues where they need to purchase multiple seats, may have an embarrassing situation at the airport. I mean, the best thing you can do in that situation is just ask and talk to the airline in advance. Um, in, terms of in terms of traveling with a ratio of ch children that is higher than, like if you have a higher ratio of children to parents, then <laughs> I, I would recommend not traveling unless yes. it's absolutely necessary, to be honest. I, that's just, I, I don't think that's helpful for anyone. And um, if I could talk about that for just one quick second, yeah. Um, my experience has been a, a one to one ratio, parent to child. Uh, when you have more than that, it can get a little bit crazy. Um, you don't know uh, what you're getting yourself into if you're dealing with a, a, a child who might be dealing with pressure issues in the plane, uh, going through a lot of pain, doing a lot of screaming, having a lot of problems sleeping, um, not yeah. wanting to sleep. Uh, you know, just acting out because they're uncomfortable. Um, it's not anything against children by any stretch of the imagination, but keep in mind that there may not be a good social environment on a, on a flight like this. I get it if you're having to travel cross country to see relatives or to, or to move or do something different, but at the same time, planning for that in advance is really helpful. So I, I I'm sorry, yeah. I just wanted to touch base on that one. Really quick. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think again with with older people, I just think there are a, a, there tend to be issues with um, you know just navigating through the physical space of an airport can be challenging, and I think that's true for anyone with mobility issues. So again, that's something where it, it's just important to request uh, request, for example, a wheelchair to get to and from uh, your gates, and then. Um, and and also on the aircraft, just making sure that you're kind of aware of whatever it is that you might need, because you are going to be in, you know, kind of stuck in a specific place for a very long period of time. Yeah. And on that topic, I know my mom is 86 years old. And so mm -hmm. her mobility has been greatly compromised over the last few years. And then part of that, you know, we, we tried to get her onto a flight and, um, you know, it, it, it was, the, the carrier was actually very accommodating. This was through United and they, you know, they had a special line that you would call in order to schedule this. They would call back and make sure that they understood exactly what the challenges were involved with that. And, and they, they planned out everything for her. So it, it, at no cost, in fact, uh, I, I don't know if that compartmentalizes with the ADA requirements that are associated with that. It may be, but at the same time, um, and for those who are not familiar with ADA, meaning the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, but I think, and I think either way from a customer service standpoint, I think it's excellent for them to be able to do that. Moving on for just a moment, let's talk about cost of travel. Now, again, different people have different, um, motivators for wanting to travel. Sometimes there's really great prices that are going on. Other times they are going for a special event. Um, but usually it falls into a variety of different things. I've listed a couple of them just on here and I'm sure there are probably more, but, um, you know, directly purchasing from the airlines, uh, using a travel aggregator site, which is my preferred method. Um, and then of course, travel agents, which are another way that's um, kind of forgotten about, but I know that there are a lot of people who still use them. Talk to us a little bit about what your preferences typically tend to gravitate towards. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, I generally use Google Flights as a travel aggregator. Um, it, it, it does some things that are helpful for me because 
in most situations, I actually don't care where I'm going. I am more interested in uh, like a particular airline or flying a particular number of miles. And those are all things that the Google Flights um, system allows you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you do get some benefits when you directly purchase from the airline, which you don't necessarily get if you purchase through an aggregator site in terms of um, like, it's just, it's just a lot easier because what you'll find is if you buy through a, a third party, you can often get bounced back and forth if something goes wrong or if there's a problem. Um, one other interesting trick with travel aggregator sites, and uh, this is something especially true on Travelocity, is you can often get a really good, uh, you can often access special business class fares by purchasing packages. So for example, um, there is a package, there, there are many package business class fares to Europe. Um, you could essentially go on Travelocity uh, and book a package, let's say to Berlin for a weekend, and all you have to do is add any hotel at all. So you can add the cheapest $10 or 10 euro a night hostel room, and suddenly you're, um, you're eligible for much lower business class fares. And you know you prepay the ten dollars for the the one hostel hostel night, and it works out really well. Um, I think I I, I work uh, I work with travel. I primarily find travel agents to be helpful when uh, working with um, cruises, especially because cruises have a lot more complications involved. And I find travel agents are very helpful in dealing with those kind of very cruise specific complications. And most travel agents that work in cruises are very specialized in that area of business. Excellent. All right. So now here's the big question. Mm -hmm. Of the airplanes that are out there currently in production and that are used by the major carriers, do you tend to be more of a person that gravitates towards Boeing or do you tend to be more of an Airbus person? I usually hear arguments on both sides, but I'm, I'm curious yeah, what your it, thoughts are. Uh, <laughs> it depends on... It depends on it, it, it really depends on the the aircraft, and I think what uh, what's interesting is that there used to be a lot more distinction in between their design philosophies, and now those have kind of changed and swipped, switched and flip flopped. Like if you think about the classic historic design philosophy of Boeing, it has been very much about pilot control, direct control of the aircraft minimal technology intervention. Whereas Airbus has historically had the opposite philosophy. They've historically looked at the aircraft, the piece of software and pilot inputs as, as kind of suggestions. Like in, a, in an Airbus situation, you're telling the, you're using your stick, your controlled stick to, to indicate to the aircraft what you want it to do. In a classic Boeing situation, you are telling the aircraft what to do. Hmm. Um, now that's been changing, uh, and I think we see it. Uh, so two of the aircraft on here that I think are the most interesting are the um, on the Boeing side the 787, and on the Airbus side the A350. Those are in direct competition to each other in that they are mid-size, long-range, highly fuel-efficient aircraft, um, but they're designed in very, very different ways. The A350 is slightly larger because it's based on just a reboot of an older model, whereas the 787 was built from scratch. But what's interesting about those is the 787 it was built with a much more technology-focused philosophy. So all of its control systems are electronic instead of hydraulic. Uh, it, so it, 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 it's kind of built better from the ground up uh, in a way that not that Airbus has not done with their aircraft. So. And actually, speaking of electronics versus hydraulics, talk to me a little bit about, uh, there was a challenge or, or a major design flaw that occurred last year, I think it was, with the oh, yeah. 737As. Um, talk to me about your understanding of that situation. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's the 737 MAX, and it's essentially anybody who's worked for a big company could, could see exactly what happened. Um, kind of the, the long and short of it is 
so uh, there are type there are type ratings for aircraft. So if you're let's say you're a pilot who has been licensed and rated to fly the 737 aircraft. Now there are a dozen different versions of the 737. They vary in size, engine, etc. But they're but they're uh, the control systems are designed so that if you're trained on one you you can fly any of them because there are minimal differences in how it handles, how it behaves, how it responds. So the problem with the 737 MAX was um, over time, as engines have gotten more efficient, they've also gotten much larger. The 737 is a 40, 50 year old design, designed for much smaller engines. So essentially there was no way to put a modern engine on it without it literally scraping the ground. So they had to move the engine on the wing up higher, which then intrinsically changes the handling characteristics of the aircraft. Mm. But because of what I was talking about before, because they want to minimize the cost of training new pilots, um, they essentially implemented secretly software that would cause the aircraft to act like the old style of engine location, even though the engine was in a new different place that was higher, uh, actually further forward and higher. Um, the problem is that pilots were not told about this and when the, and the system was not well designed, so it actually overreacted and thought that, uh, it thought that it was responding to the right inputs from the pilot when it was actually not and uh, that unfortunately caused those systems to override the, um, o override the inputs of the pilot and led to a couple of pretty serious tragedies. Yeah. Well, it's good to understand that piece. Um, I mean, it doesn't, it shouldn't put anybody off from flying the 737 MAX. Uh, again, that training has been, I believe, updated since then. Um, it is not. Oh, that's what I want. Um, uh, it's, still being, it's still being worked on. Okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I, <laughs> I, 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 very rarely, <laughs> just, I very rarely distrust things, but um, uh, that has very much shaken my trust in uh, the integrity of Boeing's design philosophy. Okay. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to like wait, I'm not going to protest the 737 Max, but um I, I have serious concerns about whether they're actually going to bring it back to the sky safely. Okay, I was gonna say, if you were on a leg of a flight and something got changed on the flight where your original plane was not available, but the 737 MAX was the replacement, would you have a problem with flying at that particular point? Or what's your- uh, I, I, I would fly it, but. I, I'm just, I'm, there's lots of things I'm skeptical with. I mean, there are, air, there are airlines I fly on where I feel like the pilot training isn't up to par either. Uh, mm -hmm. just, just something, it's just something I'm aware of. Okay. Um, <laughs> so. It's uh, good to keep in mind so that way you're, you're being responsible. Uh, let's go on to some government challenges. You know, obviously when you're talking about customs and bringing things back overseas, you know, there's a lot of different restrictions that are involved, at least in the federal regulations. In fact, on one of our previous uh, vlogs and podcasts, you talked about bringing some cigars back from Cuba, I believe, and, yeah. and that, that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, but the process can be smoothed out a little bit if you have like TSA pre-check, a mobile passport, or a global entry. Talk to us yep. a little bit about your experiences with those things. Yep. So um, I think it's absolutely a must to have whatever um, whatever customs and um, border protection advanced services are available, like period. There's, there's no sense in waiting in line and it's, it, it, it just, it doesn't take much to do. Um, global entry is the kind of the standard for the United States and it's available to US citizens, citizens of a number of countries in Europe, Canadian citizens, um, Korean citizens, and Indian citizens, although there are some troubles with the Indian implementation right now. Um, but that allows you to um, have, uh, um, actually in some places now, they're doing totally contactless um, uh, customs and border checks. 
in, in certain test airports. Um, one, uh, when you do that, you also are, uh, receive TSA pre-check, which allows you to go through the pre-check line in the airport, which is much faster. And uh, then uh, what, uh, what I have is something called Nexus, which is the US and Canadian program, because uh, there's also a similar customs program that allows you to bypass the normal customs lines in Canada. And that program is unique because you have to be interviewed and approved by both um, the US Customs and Border Protection and then also the Canadian Border Services uh, and approved. But uh, when you do that, you get advanced entry to Canada, the US, and you get TSA pre-check and it only costs $49. Nice. But in order to in order to do that, you need to live near the Canadian border because you have to be in a location where there are there's a shared facility with Canadian and U.S. Um, border officers. Um, one of the ones to keep in mind uh, is if you travel to Europe a lot through Germany, mm -hmm. you can uh, enter uh, using Easy Pass, which is just tied to your passport. And again, uh, I, I did it took about 10 minutes last time I was in Frankfurt. Um, what basically it does is it allows you as a U.S. citizen to use the EU kiosk, the EU citizen kiosk. Nice. So that's a big time saver um, if you travel through Germany. Well, if you travel anywhere <laughs> in, in Europe, it could be. It well, be yeah, as long as you're, uh, in, in, yeah, I mean, in, well, I, we can certainly, I'm glad to talk about that. But yeah, um, so because Europe has a common travel area called the Schengen area, anytime your, your initial entry point into that area which is essentially all of Europe except for Ireland, plus a few other places like Iceland and Switzerland, you only go through border checks once. So for example, if you're flying on Iceland Air to Germany, you will actually never interact with German customs officers. Your entry and exit will be controlled by Iceland customs officers. Um, and that's true anywhere in Europe. Your entry and exit is all, uh, because they basically have agreed to standards that every country agrees to yeah. um, to facilitate uh, removing internal borders. But but if you're going into the Schengen area through Germany, get easy pass, make it faster. Yeah, absolutely. So then let's talk about some resources. If people wanted to do a little bit more research on different types of planes or different airlines, what is usually the best? What what is usually the best resource that you're aware of that is out there? Yeah, um, I think so. For me, some of the very, um, the very, very air travel specific blogs, like One Mile at a Time, is uh, really, really interesting for finding out a lot about airlines. Mm -hmm. um, I find one of the things that, uh, if you're thinking about learning about different types of aircraft, one of the things that I find very interesting is going on to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And there are several YouTube channels that um, are basically just consists of annotated um, annotated uh, air traffic control recordings, which is yeah. super cool because I'm a nerd. But, uh, <laughs> well, you're very knowledgeable about the whole about, about aircraft in general. I mean, and a lot of people don't understand, like, because you don't work for the airlines, but you, this is just oh, kind of no, your passion. Just, this is a hobby, yeah. But one of the things that's really cool is as you start to listen to like air traffic control people will be talking about the behavioral characteristics of different aircraft. And then you can go into the comments and find out, you know, oh, of course that A3, uh, that A380 couldn't take taxiway K because their wingspan is this. And it, it gets, it makes things, it, you, I, you really learn a lot that way. Mm, nice. Yeah. In terms of travel programs, let's move on to that for just a second. I am a member of United Plus as well as have, Alaska, but I only use them domestically. Um, I have Southwest as well. Um, are there any ones that you tend to gravitate towards? And if so, why? Yeah, um, I think it, it really just depends on your location. So being based in Seattle, I basically have two choices because there are two airlines with hubs in Seattle, which is Alaska and Delta. For me personally, um, I used to be, uh, uh, I mean, I'm still a member of all the programs, obviously join all, join all the programs, mm -hmm. but in terms of which one you focus your time on, um, formerly when I was doing a lot more um, international travel for work, I focused my efforts on Delta. Um, but now that most of my work travel is domestic, I'm uh, focused on 
Alaska. So really, just it's mainly based on, fr frankly, where you live, what and where you're going to be traveling. Yeah, I would think that. Um, and I remember we were both in Arizona at one point, and you know, so that's that's a completely different hub. Uh, yeah. Say U.S. Uh, what is it? Um, well, it, it's it's a U.S. airway <laughs> that I think is there. I'm just, I'm trying to remember the one that was there primarily, but. Um, that there, there was a huge hub that was out of uh, Phoenix that we often saw. But um, in this modern age right now, we have to consider health and welfare of not only the staff on board, the airlines, but the passengers, the flight crew, everybody involved. And COVID-19 is a big thing. That's changing the way that a lot of people are starting to fly now. Um, can you talk to us about uh, some of the trends and things that you're hearing about when people start to get back in the air? Yep. Um, so, I mean, the biggest things are um, intentionally not full flights. So most air airlines are not selling middle seats right now. So I have a couple of upcoming uh, flights that are um, you know, where there's no middle seats available, which is great. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is most airlines are not doing any sort of food and beverage service, mm. or it's extremely, extremely limited. Um, so even if, uh, so, you know, if I was actually talking to a friend of mine about this, who was uh, considering, uh, upgrading to a uh, premium class or first class. And I pointed out that it was highly unlikely he would get any benefits of that because there would be no food or beverage service. And he would, no matter where on the plane he was sitting, he wouldn't have anyone sitting next to him. So, um, it is something to consider for sure. Yeah. What about as far as disinfecting the planes go? Have you heard anything about that? Um, I know. I know that there are uh, that most airlines are now doing extra cleaning of any of the commonly touched surfaces with disinfectants. Mm -hmm. I've heard that there's some fumigation happening, but to yeah. be frank, I don't quite understand the point of that. Most fumigation that happens on aircraft is related to like insects and pests, so I'm not really sure what viral fumigation they're doing but that just may be my ignorance no no i can i can speak i can speak to that a little bit because i think i've been tracking what they've been doing on cruise lines as of recent and what they're what they're doing is um at, at least one of the things i was talking about uh, and and i'll cite Genting, which is a cruise line that's out of asia and one of the things that they're doing now is they're going to distance cabins from each other so if say, for example, you have cabin one, three, five, seven, and nine for this specific cruise, that means that two, four, six, eight, and 10 will be fumigated and deeply cleaned during the off week. And then the following week, all the even cabins get used and all the odd cabins get completely disinfected. Oh, interesting. So seeing how there, how there's a strategy to safety that's heavily involved in that process is, is interesting. I've seen also that Las Vegas is starting to use some fumigation mach machines in order to do some kind of um, like almost like a Clorox type mister that's, that's going over certain surfaces. While they don't recommend that to be done on people, they are still doing that with respect to the surfaces so that way people feel more comfortable. Also, another thing that Vegas is doing is they're going to be starting to use either um, uh, like uh, uh, you, you use your own cell phone in order to place bets or you can use um, uh, the chips still, but those are going to be like more uh, clean, clean more periodically than they had been in the past. Okay. So interesting stuff. Uh, a couple more things I want to talk about. Um, one, are, one is communications. Now, obviously we were talking just briefly uh, earlier about flight plans and, and, and things like that. If there's a change in the flight plan, uh, that has to be, that has to go through a lot of different steps in order to update that piece, correct? Um, now when you say flight plan, do you mean like the literal flight plan, uh, the waypoints that the aircraft is flying yes. or are you talking about like changes in schedules? Like changes in, uh, in destinations. So if say for example, we're traveling from Los Angeles to Tokyo, Japan, and something happens or there, maybe there's a, a, a weather event, we're going to have to change our flight path, pathing or something happens in Tokyo where uh, maybe there's civil unrest. I don't know. I'm just pulling out something as an example. Uh, at Tokyo, we might have to divert to a different airport along the way. Um, are you familiar with what the protocols are for something like that? Um, or would it just be contact with I, yeah, I don't know if I would call it a pro I mean, you just kind of go somewhere else. 
Oh. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Where they can take you. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, communications with the flight crew and instructions. Whenever we get into those flights, they talk about FAA regulations require that you pay um, attention to uh, uh, both flight crew and ground crew instructions, and you're adhere in that. And to violate that is against the law. Correct. Yeah, it's a really great way for airlines to bully people around. Um, I, well, I, I, there's certainly no reason to be unintentionally disrespectful to flight crew, obviously. Yeah. But that particular federal regulation is often abused to either um, it can be it can be abused to uh, to punish passengers who are merely inconvenient. So, but but regardless, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the pilot is in complete control of the aircraft, and if he or she decides that you're not adequately following instructions, then she has the right to get you off the aircraft. Yeah, um, and that same aspect, we always hear about putting your phones to like a, a, a airline mode or turning them off. Do you have any idea why that might be the case? There's no good reason. It's just nobody wants to be the person that says it's okay to do it. That's, oh, really? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the bottom line is there's no real legitimate scientific evidence that there's any kind of danger from using cell phones on an aircraft. Hmm. But uh, nobody wants to be the person that signs off on saying, oh, yeah, it's safe. And then, you know, the next day, there's some kind of incident that nobody would have planned for. Mm. But I mean, the bottom line is everyone is using, everyone is leaving their cell phones on, on airplanes, whether we you know, you know, whether they officially believe, believe it or not, right? You know, a substantial number of people don't actually power down the transmission and receiving capabilities of their, of their mobile phone on aircraft. And it has no, there's no example of it having any kind of effect on the navigation or electronic systems. So um, I, it's just kind of a thing. And to be honest, I don't mind it because the last thing I want is somebody talking on their phone next to me. Yeah. Although I know that, like we, we were saying, with um, different airline carriers, um, and I'll bring up Southwest and United as examples, with your cell phone, I think they have a service now where you can start to do texting um, on your cell yeah. phone. Uh, but you have to register it with with the airline carrier, and then once that's done, you can do the like. Yeah, most of the U.S. carriers offer that offer a text service via over their Wi-Fi system. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And obviously it's, yeah, done over Wi-Fi. Yeah, and obviously we know that for for many years now there has not been smoking on flights, but there's this whole trend about no e-cigarettes now either. Is it just because of the fear of seeing something smoking in the cabin like like that? Or is it more of a, there's some question as to whether or not that can actually be harmful? Do you, do you have um, a name? Yeah, I actually don't know about that one. I don't have a good answer to that. I've heard a couple of mixed things. And I think I, I, from one of the flight attendants I had heard, it has to do with, even though you're not physically, for those who don't smoke e-cigarettes, um, they're basically just a humidifier that you put in your mouth and it's giving you like a nicotine buzz and, and, and that type of thing. So for those people who are having those 25 hour flights or wherever to get to from one place to another and not having the access to a cigarette break, being able to use something like that potentially could be beneficial. But at the same time, if it has a negative psycho social, social impact on the flight because it looks like someone's lighting a fire or there's something on on board then that can create a panic and i think that's where some of that challenge that comes through i don't know for certain but that's what i was told by one of the flight crew members so i don't know where that goes but one of the final things i want to bring up on this is safety and security um obviously over the last several years especially after 9 11 um things have changed dramatically um, we, with, the, with the implementation of TSA and, and uh, more than just metal detectors, now there are uh, actual x-rays at airports. Um, uh, some of them are pretty easy to get through. Some of them you just walk by and it automatically images you. Others you have to go inside and, and sometimes you have to get pat down. Other times it's a full body cavity search. Um, what has your experience been with uh, airport security and plane security as well? Um. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't believe that our current, uh, I don't believe that the current model of aircraft security is in any way effective and it misses, whenever tested, misses most weapons that are, you know, that, that are intended to be carried through it. So it's primarily there as uh, a, a deterrent maybe and as a way to make the travel, traveling public to generally feel safer. Um, uh, so I think that, I mean, but I think that the biggest advice is just to, to frankly, just think before you go through air, airport security, like think about, oh gosh, I have a belt on, like give yourself a quick pat down before you, you know, while you're waiting in line, what do I have on me? Because you're just going to slow things down for yourself when you have something unexpected in a pocket or in a belt or on a jacket. And, so and I think that's the biggest thing. A couple of things I wanted to also bring up in reference to airplane security, because um, we don't typically think about it. We think once you're past the security, everything's fine, peachy. But there are two examples I can think of. Um, one was on an Italian flight I was on where um, there was an older lady on board who didn't speak any English, and she insisted on not moving out of a seat that she wanted to sit in. And so the flight crew were very uneased by this and uh, it was disruptive of the flight. And so they had to get someone on board to be able to speak. Otherwise we were not going anywhere or they were going to remove her. The other wow. thing that, the other thing I thought of um, that in terms of security on a plane, and this went to what you were talking about earlier about, you know, take, just don't be a jerk is, um, you know, I was on a flight from Los Angeles to Las Vegas where there were a bunch of girls that were going to do this, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a bridal shower or like a, a thing like that. Right. And, yeah. and they were, they were harassing a male flight attendant that was on board. And we went right back to the tarmac and there were some of the biggest burliest professional wrestler size ground crew that came on board to physically remove the women that had done this. And after that, I mean, we, like everybody was applauding at that point <laughs> because it was like, we were already delayed by an hour because of this. So you know, we were just like, so in other words, what I'm trying to get here is don't be a jerk. Don't, you know, if, if be, be understanding the flight crew's got a very difficult job. And part of this process is just to make sure that, you know, you get there safely and securely and that um, everything is as it should be through the process. And have you had any major hurdles with uh, in, in plane security before? Not think? really, actually. I've been pretty, I've, I've had, I've had mostly pretty smooth sailing, I guess. So I guess I'm the only one that has that on my plane. So great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Well, but um, I do want to thank you so much again, Chad, um, yeah, sure. for, for being here and sharing your vast amount of knowledge about aircraft with us as well as airlines. It, it really does mean a lot. I've learned a lot today. So I thank you so very much for that. Glad to. Yeah, I enjoy it. Now, for, for my students that are out there, if you have any questions or comments, by all means, please feel free to send them to scott at theprofessortravel.com. If you like this as a video that you're watching right now, um, please give it a thumbs up. You, if you haven't already subscribed, by all means, please do so. If you want to be notified when new videos come out, simply hit the bell icon that's right above the screen in order to be notified. And if you're listening to this on a podcast, we really do appreciate when you um, like it, uh, give us a five-star rating. We always appreciate that. But until our next time meeting, make sure every day is a travel adventure. Take care, everybody. Have a great one. Bye, Thanks a lot. <laughs>